Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here are some of the top stories we've been following. Ukrainian President Zelensky says he's committed to more talks of peace as Russian attacks continue in many regions of his country. The French election is taking place with incumbent President Emmanuel Macron surviving round one. And there's a call for more donors to come out in Lethbridge as Canadian blood services say they're running desperately low on plasma. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Robbins. Thanks so much for joining us. Voting has begun to determine the political fate of Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. Card-carrying UCP members have until May 11th to get their votes in to determine if Kenny will continue to lead the party. The results will be made official on May the 18th. Kenny has faced open dissent from some party and caucus members for more than a year now. He made it clear in a recent speech that this vote must end the feuding one way or another. Almost 60,000 party members will be voting on whether he should remain on as leader of the United Conservative Party. If Kenny receives less than 50 plus 1% of the votes, a leadership race must be called. French political leaders voted in the first round of the presidential election as Emmanuel Macron is seeking his second five-year term. Macron is one of 12 candidates running to become president. His biggest competitor is far-right candidate Marine Le Pen. Now, as the results have come in, the BBC is reporting that Emmanuel Macron won the first round with 27.6% of the vote, while Le Pen took 23.4%. In a French national election, if no candidate wins over 50% of the vote, a second round is organized. Only the top two candidates qualify for the second round, which will be Macron and Le Pen. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari says many in Europe seem to be embracing more right-leaning candidates as seen with the rise in popularity of Marine Le Pen. She says the mindset of many Europeans appears to be changing. And the fact that there is a far-right candidate tells me that Europeans see the damage of these lax policies by the left and is moving to the right and giving more politicians on the right a chance uh, to bring in that nationalism, to close their borders, to not be so lax on immigration and other policies. So it's definitely a wake-up call for France and, and all, many other European nations. Lisa Daftari will have the latest from the war in Ukraine coming up in the second half of our program. Well, the mayor of Mariupol, Ukraine, says the death toll in the city could be well over 20,000 people. The Ukrainian armed forces said that Russian troops are continuing to attack the city in southeastern Ukraine. And in the south of Ukraine, near Kherson, reports say Russian forces are trying to gain a foothold in the administrative borders. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says so far more than 4 million people have fled the fighting to neighboring countries such as Poland, creating a huge humanitarian crisis there. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says he's committed to pressing for peace despite what he alleges are Russian attacks on civilians that have simply stunned the world. Кожна сім'я щось втратила. Є люди, які втратили дітей. Я не думаю, що їх задовольнить будь-який мир і на будь-яких умовах, і на будь-який час. Тому що це велика рана і велика трагедія втратити близьких, рідних людей. Але якщо ми говоримо не емоційно, хоча це складно, ми повинні розуміти, що будь-яка війна закінчиться, повинна закінчитися миром або... A number of buildings in Ukraine have been either badly damaged or completely destroyed since the war with Russia began in February. A priest in Ukraine talks about his damaged church located just outside of the Ukrainian capital and how the church is trying to maintain faith and hope as the war with Russia rages on. Ну, будемо шукати можливість ремонтувати ремонт. Кошти ж треба все. Ну, будемо чекати, поки бачите, поки, я думаю, поки їх не виганять з нашої країни, то поки у вікна, вікна позакриваємо, щоб там мародерство не було більше. As Russian forces give up territory in Ukraine and retreat, farmers are among those discovering the cost of occupation and the devastation that was left behind. 
коли кинули фугасний снаряд сюди, у нас виход один з цього сарая. І коли кинули його прямо ось при вході, ми не могли, не змогли туди ні з людьми, воно зразу стало горіти, зверху було сіно ще лежало, і воно сіно це зайнялося. Дуже кричали поросята, телята, вони жарилися живьом, горіли. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson joined other European leaders showing their support of Ukraine by traveling to Kyiv over the weekend to meet with Ukraine's President Zelensky. Johnson said Russia underestimated the resilience of the Ukrainian people. Russians believed that Ukraine could be engulfed in a matter of days and that Kyiv would fall in hours uh, to, their, uh, to their armies. And how wrong they were. And I think that uh, the Ukrainians have shown the courage of a lion, but you, Volodymyr, have given the roar of that lion. A group calling themselves Hatters Helping Ukraine has started in Medicine Hat, Alberta, with a goal to raise money to help family members and friends find safety here in Canada. George Kovalev, the founder of the group, says his family members have seen unspeakable horrors and the need to help it's very strong that Canadians will help them. George says some of the funds sent by governments is not going to humanitarian aid, but instead is being taken by government officials being used to buy weapons for the Ukrainian army. I understand that uh, when people are in distress, people are dying of starvation, people lacked of a basic services, supposed to be taken care of first. And then whenever you have, and if you're willing to, you can give it to the army or the government or whatever, we're unfortunately working the other way around. We send the money to the government, which is rated as one of the most corrupt governments in the world. And if you look back, but people don't like to look back, but if you look back into the coverage for Ukrainian president, just a few months ago, they tell the stories about the millions of dollars brought into offshores, about his ties with all sorts of shady characters. BCN's Jeanette Rocher will have more on Hatters Helping Ukraine on Tuesday's program. By the way, the group has already helped two families come to Canada and hope to raise funds to help 10 more families find safety here in our country. To connect with Hatters Helping Ukraine, you can email the group at hattershelpingukraine at gmail.com. Well, the spring-like weather conditions we had been experiencing will be ending soon, with it feeling more like winter again here in southwestern Alberta. Jeanette Rocher is here now with an early look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, the winter-like conditions may include periods of snow once again? Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, Hal, but yes, it does look like this evening we could see uh, some more flurries uh, lasting into tomorrow as well, and even periods of snow tomorrow evening and into Wednesday as well. Not only that, but those temperatures are also going to be back into the minuses again, just when we thought that spring was here. Uh, good news, though, we're going to be back up in the pluses by the time we get to our long weekend ahead of us. So I will have those details coming up for you later on in the newscast. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Fort McLeod Councillor Marco Van Hugenboss's role in helping organize the Coots border blockade was unacceptable as a councillor. That's according to Fort McLeod Mayor Brent Fader, who told the councillor through a letter of reprimand that was read at the March 28th council meeting. Fader says that while members of public office need to be held to a higher level of conduct, he also encourages the public to think about the broader picture. And it's not about one individual here. It's about what was the message of the whole convoy, and we can't skip over that. A lot of people uh, have been concerned with how things have been going, but it seems a lot of times um, people aren't being heard. And it's at some point people are like, what do we do? And um, we all have a responsibility to make our country better. It's not just one leader, it's just not a bunch of people here and there. It's how do we all keep each other accountable to a higher level of um, responsibility and accountability for our country. Now, in the letter, Fader wrote, any further instances by Hugenbos could result in sanctions, including removal from town committees. City of Lethbridge councillors and staff from the Lethbridge Fire and Emergency Services showcased five pallets of firefighting equipment supplies on Monday afternoon that will be sent to help firefighters in Ukraine. A few of the items included medical kits, PPE, and disposable wound care items. As BCN's Micah Quinn explains now, the donations will be given to an organization to ship to Ukraine and distribute the supplies. 
To date, we've shipped a total of 170 full sets of bunker gear, about 40 ballistic vests. The Lethbridge Fire and Emergency Services is working with an organization called Firefighter Aid Ukraine to send over these pallets of firefighting equipment to the country. This is the fifth load of protective gear that will be sent to Ukraine as the war against Russia rages on. So the protective gear and the breathing packs will go from Edmonton direct to Ukraine to a depot there that they distribute it from. Some of the medical equipment goes to Calgary where it's Canadian Mercy, ships it out and they've already got hospitals allocated. So I sent this list up last week. They've already got it allocated to the specific hospitals. And then a large amount goes to an aid station. Um, lady we know, a friend of ours, she's on the border in an aid camp, and that's where some will go right on the Polish-Canadian border. On March 22nd, Lethbridge City Council voted unanimously in their support for the city's fire department to donate the surplus firefighting equipment. Members of the fire department said it was a no-brainer to donate these items. It's hard to imagine what it's like to try and go to a fire uh, while you're being shot at or when your fire station's been leveled or your family's been evacuated and yet you're still uh, responding to people in need. The five pallets of equipment will be shipped out on Thursday which will bring the total to 240 sets of fire gear that will be given out to assist firefighters in Ukraine. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. The Lethbridge Plasma Donor Centre is in dire need of plasma donations as the Easter weekend draws near. Now, a total of 361 appointments need to be filled for this week. Brenna Scott, the business development manager for the centre, says donating plasma is vital to helping patients in life or death situations. Plasma is part of your blood and uh, your blood is divided into three parts. So you have the plasma, you have your red blood cells and you have your white blood cells. What the plasma does is it really helps the antibodies and helps protect you from infection. And what our plasma is used for is once it's collected, it's sent to our fractionator and it's made into different kinds of medications. And what plasma can be used for is for patients with cancer, with kidney disease, liver disease, uh, immune deficiencies and a lot of different surgeries as well. So it is used for a wide range of uh, patients here in Canada. Scott says that same-day appointments are available for plasma donation by booking online at blood.ca. A special honour has been bestowed on a couple of grain elevators in the town of Nanton, Alberta. The 95 and 93-year-old landmarks were officially granted designation as a provincial historic resource. The designation, which is a form of legal protection, means the elevators will be eligible for more funding and grant opportunities from both the federal and provincial governments. Officials say the historical stamp will allow necessary repairs to take place and will help to further develop the site as a tourist attraction. Environment Canada is forecasting a major blizzard will hit southern Manitoba and southeastern Saskatchewan with up to 50 centimetres of snow early Tuesday evening. The heavy snow and winds and up to 90 kilometres an hour will also continue until Wednesday. Forecasters say higher terrain in western Manitoba could see up to 80 centimetres of the white stuff. Officials say the spring storm has the potential to be one of the worst blizzards in decades. Ontario's health minister says her province will reinstate mask mandates if Ontario's chief medical officer of health makes the recommendation. Christine Elliott says COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations have been rising to the point that Public Health Ontario has issued a report that proposes bringing back indoor masking. It also recommends extending mask mandates in high-risk settings to mitigate a surge in cases. Some have also asked why masks are no longer being used in schools. There's been no significant rise in the risk of children in the intensive care unit. So of all of Ontario, 2.75 million children, there's two in the intensive care unit right now. On average, we're having uh, 30 to 60 children admitted to hospital. Some of those are incidental admissions to hospital as well uh, over a one-week period. So we've not seen any significant threat to the uh, health of children. American researchers have found that rates of heart inflammation following COVID-19 vaccination are comparable to or lower than rates after non-COVID-19 vaccines. Data was reviewed from 22 studies, including 11, that looked at outcomes after COVID-19 vaccine doses. They found that the rate of heart inflammation following COVID-19 vaccination was 18 cases per million doses. The risk was three times higher for those who received mRNA vaccines. The 18 cases per million doses compares with 56 million doses for other viral vaccinations such as flu or smallpox vaccines. Canada's Brad Gushu dropped an 8-6 decision to Sweden's Nicholas Eden in the gold medal game at the World Men's Curling Championship. Gushu gave credit to his opponent but says 
he was a little disappointed in the ice quality at the arena in Las Vegas. Yeah, you know what? I'm 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 not that disappointed with the loss, to be honest. I'm I'm disappointed that a you know a really cool experience was kind of taken away from our team. Like when you get in the the moments like this where you're one sheet you know, world championship, you want to go out there and display what you're able to do and, and have a good battle and, and uh, you know, make some shots and get the crowd roaring. And, and that was taken away from us. The ice was just so so bad that it, it became a, you know, a coin toss on every rock. And, and unfortunately, you know, they uh, it came up heads for, for Nicholas a little bit more than it did for us. You know, congratulations to the Gushu for some silver medal. Still not bad. You know, it feels a bit like curling weather here in southwestern Alberta. It appears as though will be well below seasonal values weather-wise in Lethbridge over the next few days. We also may be seeing some snow developing. Full weather details are on deck. It appears as though those warm temperatures we've been experiencing have left us for now. Jeanette Rocher is here now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, not only will the mercury be dropping, but we should also be seeing more of the white stuff. Say it ain't so. Well, I'm sorry to say that it is so hell. I know, just when we thought we were putting this winter stuff behind us, it does look like we are going to be seeing a chance of flurries into this evening periods of snow, Tuesday, Tuesday night, and even into Wednesday. And look at those temperatures. We're gonna be dropping into the minuses, minus nine overnight. Tomorrow's high, only minus six, minus eight the high on Wednesday. Uh, hard to believe that it's almost the middle of April. It feels more like February. Minus three the high on Thursday with mainly cloudy skies. Up to zero Friday. And then, like I said before, we're getting up to the pluses for our long Easter weekend ahead of us. Five degrees on Saturday, eight degrees on a Sunday, on Easter Sunday. That is partly cloudy skies for that day as well. Now, as we look to the Almanac, they tell us that the average high for this time of year, 12 degrees, that's where we should be. Not so much this week, minus two the average low. That's kind of more where we're going to be. 22 degrees was our high temperature on this day back in 1943 and in 1940. We were at minus 26. Hopefully we don't get there uh, into later on this week. Uh, 647 is the sunrise the today and this evening 817 is our sunset. So giving us about 13 and a half hours of daylight. As we look to the west coast, we're seeing um, showers, uh, risk of a thunderstorm. Uh, some flurries as well in Victoria, 8 degrees the high up to 60k uh, winds in the Juan de Fuca Strait. Vancouver, 7 degrees the high risk of a thunderstorm there as well. Edmonton and Calgary, 30% chance of flurries in both of those cities, minus 7 in Edmonton, minus 6 the high in Calgary tomorrow. As we look to the rest of the prairies, minus 4 the high in both Saskatoon and Regina, partly cloudy skies in both of those cities with winds 30 to 50 kilometers per hour, 4 degrees the high in Winnipeg. Uh, now a spring blizzard is also poised to hit uh, southern Manitoba and Saskatchewan by midweek, so we're going to be keeping our eye on that. Uh, 15 degrees in Toronto tomorrow should be a lovely day there. Sunshine, mix of sun and cloud in Ottawa tomorrow, high of 15. 14 the high in Montreal with rain showers there. As we look to Fredericton, we're going to be seeing two millimeters of rain expected tomorrow there. 10 degrees the high. Halifax expecting some rain as well. Charlottetown uh, rain should be clearing up later on in the day though. Uh, 9 degrees the high, 3 degrees the high in St. John's. Newfoundland also could see uh, some flurries and up to 70 kilometer per hour wind. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Loblaw Company says Doritos, Ruffles and Cheetos will be back on store shelves by next weekend after it resolved a high profile pricing dispute with Frito-Lay. The feud saw one of Canada's largest food makers stop shipments of snacks to the country's largest grocer. Loblaw Company officials declined to comment on specific vendor negotiations, but says the grocer is happy to have a wider assortment in its chip aisles once again. A spokesperson from Frito-Lay says the company has mutually resolved matters and is looking forward to resuming product distribution in the coming days. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in Victoria Monday, where he made an announcement highlighting more investments in electric vehicle infrastructure. The federal budget table last week placed a heavy emphasis on transitioning to a greener economy. The feds announced new investments in critical minerals, metals, and expanding the availability of zero-emission vehicles and charging stations. The emissions reduction plan added a goal this month that one in five new cars sold be zero emissions by the year 2026, and by 2030, the target is 60%. We're also going to make EVs easier to charge. We're building a national network of chargers on top of the thousands already installed or under construction. 
with this budget, with everything we've been working on, we're moving forward on everything from a new tax credit for clean tech to protecting old growth forests to retrofits for people's homes. The CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, will not be joining Twitter's board of directors as previously announced. The billionaire does, however, remain on as Twitter's largest shareholder. Twitter CEO Parag Agrawal tweeted the news following a weekend of Musk tweets suggesting possible changes to Twitter, including making the site ad-free. Close to 90% of Twitter's 2021 revenue came from ads. Insurance company Intact Financial says 80% of its catastrophe losses for the first quarter of about $183 million were weather-related. The property insurer says the loss amounted to 81 cents per share after tax. It says around 60% of the losses were in the United Kingdom and Ireland, which were hit hard by windstorms in February. The remaining losses were in its Canadian business, with around 75% attributed to personal property. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 83 points on the day to finish at 21,790. The Dow was down 413 points to 34,308. The S&P 500 was down 75 points to 44.12. And the Nasdaq was down 299 on the day to 13,411. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 397 to 94.29 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 37 cents to 664 US. Gold was up 14 cents to 1953.67 US an ounce and silver was even on the day at 25.10 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $13.69 per bushel, barley's at $9.69, canola's at $25.74, and corn is at $11.74 per bushel. Live cattle were up 70 cents to $138.53, feeder cattle were up 10 cents to $156.65, and lean hogs were down 60 cents to $98.43. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to 79.17 U.S. We have some breaking news regarding new Canadian sanctions against Russia. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie says the new measures impose restrictions on 33 entities in the Russian defence sector. Following Russia's attack that began February 24th, Canada's imposed sanctions on more than 700 individuals and entities from Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari will have the latest on the war in Ukraine, including news that the White House sent $1.7 billion in military assistance to help Ukrainians in their fight against Russia. Lisa will have details shortly. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. Come out for some family fun at Easter at the Galt, taking place Saturday, April 16th from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Enjoy exciting performances by Left Bridge's Trianda Ukrainian Dance Club. Challenge your family to an epic egg battle and explore the Galt as you hunt for Easter eggs. Cost for admission is $6 per person and free for annual pass holders. Spots are limited, so book early by going to gulpmuseum.com. Discover unique gifts and support local art and culture. The Lethbridge Handmade Market is taking place Saturday, April 23rd at Exhibition Park from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Over 85 handmade artisans will be displaying their beautiful creations. Plus, enjoy delicious treats from local food trucks, door prizes, a community painting project, and kids can participate in a scavenger hunt. Parking is free and admission is $5 per person. Kids 14 and under can enter for free. For more information, visit lethbridgehandmademarket.ca. And that's your Bridge City News community calendar.
Thousands of civilians have lost their lives. Countless soldiers have also died. And the United Nations reports more than 4 million refugees have now fled war in Ukraine. To discuss this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, we've had a couple of ceasefires fall through. Any chance this war will be coming to an end anytime soon? You know, we have had some... Uh here and there, just signs of, of hope or some signs of both sides wanting to come and sit down to talk. Uh, we had a list of six items that Putin would want for a ceasefire. And we had Zelensky saying, look, I'm ready. I'm re I want to sit down for talks uh, right away. Um, but for some reason, we keep moving away from that. We're seeing escalation on both sides. We're seeing you know, the Ukrainians rolling up their sleeves and doubling down. And we're seeing the Russians bring in another convoy and go after more cities. And obviously, as you said, the devastation uh, the, the loss of life, the 4 million refugees who um, will, will never have their lives be the same again, the families, the babies. Uh, and, you know, just, just seeing uh, the images out of Ukraine, this is a full-fledged war. And for that reason, we don't know when we're going to see an end to it. This is not something that we can say, you know, uh, even if there's a ceasefire, you know, life will go back to, uh, you know, usual. Um, this is going to be something that's ongoing. The 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 build, you know, building back up again, you know, finding um, finding you know sort of survivors and and having people find their family members, uh, and on the Russian side. Will Putin ever really back down? Will he surrender? We don't. We don't think so. And based on, you know, calculations of how he's operated in the past and how he's operating now, yes, there is some sort of miscalculation. Yes, he is changing his tactics. There are reports that he's changing some of his commanders uh, in order to have a different and better, hopefully, strategy on his part. Um, but that just means, you know, we're going to have more war, more devastation, and uh, the the uh, you know optimism that we we had throughout this is is really not there today. Now, the reports as well, Lisa, that Russia has tapped into a decorated general to take control of the war ahead of the potential showdown in eastern Ukraine that could begin within the next few days. Right. And, you know, um, Hal, this just points to the fact that, yes, you know, the, the reports all along have been that there has been miscalculation on the Russian part. And I absolutely do believe that that is what has happened. That's why we haven't seen this, um, uh, you know, have a, a much quicker turnaround. If you had told me a year ago that you know, Russia is going to invade Ukraine, I would say it's going to take about two days, at most a week. It would never take this long had the Russians, you know, um, calculated this in the right way. At the same time, it's very hard for me to believe uh, that Putin is not the calculated statesman that he is. All right, let's just say he's surrounded by people that didn't give him the, the right information. But why wasn't this turned around or improved in the first couple of days or the first couple of weeks even, you know? Um, so we are far into this and it's taking much longer than uh, anyone has anticipated. A lot of weapons coming in, a lot of weapons weapons. Uh, and, you know, it makes one question, you know, what is the end goal here? And for the Russians, yes, they're changing their commanders. They're trying to get, you know, better tactics in. They have an eight mile convoy, according to satellite reports going into eastern Ukraine. So it just looks like they are really turning up or amping this up in order to see, uh, you know, more victory on their end. Uh, but again, we, you know, we, you don't know what to believe. I hear the far desk we report um, from the ground as much as we can. We do have two journalists there that that are reporting to us from what they're seeing. But it's very difficult to piece everything together to have it make sense. But I guess you know that's the news cycle these days. It's very difficult to see how how things make sense to get into the psyche of you know rogue dictators and see what they're up to, what their end goal is, and, and how this will end. And really, again, I I, I really want to underscore the humanitarian crisis is here in the war, which is really affecting the people on the ground more than, than, than ever, ever before in this region. Now, let's circle back to the weapons for just a moment here. The United States says it's committed to providing Ukraine with the weapons it needs to defend itself against Russia. Now, the White House, Lisa, says it has sent $1.7 billion in military assistance to Ukraine since Russia launched its invasion on February 24th. Right. And that, that's the, the belief for a lot of lawmakers and a lot of those who are in the White House is to say, obviously, we don't want to have 
uh, boots on the ground. We don't want to get involved militarily, um, but we will send them all the resources they need, the Ukrainians need to get the job done. And that is why, uh, you know, the White House has pledged several times already. And 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 again, re- more recently um, today to say that we will send them everything that they need um, in addition to the monetary uh, aid that, that they have pledged, which is the upwards of, of uh, one billion, as you said, um, close to two. Now we will see more weapons flying into Ukraine. Look, there is, you know, uh, again, the lawmakers are believing that this is the way to stay out of this. This is a way to prevent escalation by preventing World War III. And you see that talking point thrown a lot, around a lot. But the weapons that we're get, getting there, um, you know, we've already had reports of these weapons allegedly getting into the wrong hands. They're getting either into the wrong hands on the Ukrainian side. So these are like th- street thugs that are using them against, you know, uh, common civilians to rob them and mug them and do whatever they want to do. Um, but they're also getting into the wrong hands potentially on the Russian side because they can confiscate them. And we're just putting more more weapons into the system. And obviously more weapons will cause more death and cause more devastation and um, destruction. So, you know, there's pros and cons on, on both sides of this this argument to keep flooding weapons into Ukraine. But again, here in the United States, that's the belief that we will give them all the tools necessary for them to get the job done so that we don't have to get involved. And as you mentioned earlier, this is a huge humanitarian crisis. Ukrainian railways announced that multiple evacuation trains could be seen departing from eastern Ukraine to transport people farther west. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So, you know, the the goal here is to get people out of Ukraine. And I have interviewed people who tell me all I need is a train ticket or a bus ticket out to the borders. Now, when they get out of Ukraine, then, you know, they, they can basically... Um, handle the challenge or the obstacle of getting to wherever they want to go, where their final destination will be. But obviously, the uh, priority is getting themselves out of harm's way and getting themselves out of Ukraine. Now, Second step is many, many, many have gone to Poland. Poland now has reported that they cannot absorb any more refugees. They are overflowing with refugees. And that is an actual you know, crisis there, because if they cannot absorb these uh, people, there will be a humanitarian crisis there. There will be lack of supplies, lack of housing, lack of everything else that, that's necessary to get these uh, refugees settled. So now, as you said, th- there is this, um, you know, th- the, the strategy now is to move people more west so that 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 there is no real uh, bottlenecking anywhere so that these refugees have an actual chance to resettle, to have you know whatever they need for themselves and their families. And again, how we had one of our freelance photographers on the ground in Ukraine, we have a 52 uh, photo slideshow of the devastation and it shows the babies and the families and the you know average you know Ukrainian trying to stand in line for a supermarket or trying to just hide in a basement or get to school or anything like that. There is no semblance of of normalcy or normal life there at this point. Uh, and, and really, that that's the real story here. Now, Russia says it will take legal action if the West tries to force it to default on its sovereign debt, Lisa. Finance Minister Sulyanov says they want to ensure that investors receive their payments. What would that actual legal option look like for them? Yeah, this is hilarious. I mean, hilarious in a, in a very ridiculous way, because imagine, uh, you know, th- they are so, you know, rogue. They are so, uh, they're such bullies globally that they want to say, look, even now with the sanctions, we're not going to take this. We're going to sue you. That's the actual threat here is to sue uh, over their uh, economic devastation. Um, so, so far, Russia has been able to work this system. And the loophole that they have found is that they've been making interest only payments so that they don't have to default. Once they do have to default, that's when they're saying, we're going to sue because we're not going to be able to obviously function. And um, it's already been very difficult because the sanctions have been very hard hit, hitting um, not only to the billionaires. I know a lot of the articles out there are like, we got this guy's yacht and we got this billionaire. Well, the 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 strategy there is to get these billionaires to put pressure on the uh, Russian uh, government to stop and to stop Putin from going forward. Um, but really, the the real uh, sanctions that have been really devastating for the, the Russian people has been to stop any sort of, of imports, to stop any sort of, of banking infrastructures, to stop credit cards, to stop banks. Um, and that has really taken a toll. So this is the threat. If you take us to the next level, if we have to default, then we're coming after you. Have you heard any reports of the Russian oligarchs trying to overthrow the Putin government? Tried to take control and stop this war once and for all? 
Yes, it's interesting you say that. We actually had an article up at the Foreign Desk uh, last week talking about how the oligarchs are working together with the opposition um, to push uh, Putin out of office, and they have already found his replacement. The replacement is the estranged um, commander who was in charge of the Ukraine strategy that Putin has now had a huge falling out with. There's a rift between them that is um, very, very serious because Putin has tried to blame him for the uh, poor strategy of, of invading Ukraine. Uh, the opposition and um, as well as the oligarchs believe that this guy could be a good replacement for Putin and is trying to uh, obviously, you know, muster up some support or get some popularity behind this 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 idea or this movement. Uh, obviously, you know how Russia is. If anyone tries to even speak poorly about Putin or or report about him, these these uh, journalists are taken out. The uh, publications are shut down. These uh, opposition members are arrested. So this is not something that can go over easy uh, on the ground in Russia. But this is the idea that is floating around. Lisa, there's a report coming out from the Wall Street Journal that China is stockpiling nuclear weapons capable of striking us right here in North America. The communist country is reportedly accelerating the development of more than 100 suspected missile silos. And when we're not looking, let's look what's going on right under our noses, right? So China, um, obviously, the most the most um, informed satellite reports and the most informed experts tell us not to take our eyes off of China, and that will always be the biggest global threat. It's not going to be, um, you know, all of these other things that we're we're focused on, whether it's our southern border or if it's, you know, some sort of dossier or we're looking at internal politics here in the United States or whatever it may be. But really, China is the biggest global threat because they are committed to taking out North America. They are committed to taking out the West and they're committed to becoming the biggest world power. And guess what? They are well on their way. And this report is not very reassuring when we know that they are stockpiling and they're growing their military assets and they, they that this is their plan. Look, they've been very straightforward about it. We can't blame them for uh, you know, the lack of transparency because look, they have been straightforward about wanting to take us out. Now, we didn't go hard on them with the COVID um, lack of transparency. We didn't go, you know, after them for their, you know, economic loopholing and um, taking advantage of the West. Uh, and now, you know, we see that they're growing their influence in the region, in, in the in the China Sea and the Red Sea, and um, they are, you know, the, the, their neighbors are really worried about this threat, about the Chinese growing their influence, and they're going to start regionally and they will expand. They want global influence, and they're buying influence in other places. You look at the African continent, you look at the Middle East, they're buying roads and infrastructures, they're buying the internet, um, the, the telecommunications lines. This is what they want. They want influence and they are well on their way. So all eyes on China. This is not a threat that we can take our eyes off of. There are other reports now that Israeli forces had to deal with a number of terrorist incidents across the country recently. Lisa, police carried out large arrest raids in the northern West Bank targeting Palestinian terrorists. Yes, this is awful. And I thank you, Hal, for covering this because we don't see this in the mainstream media. We will begin to see it in the mainstream media when Israel has to start to retaliate. And then you will see the tanks rolling in. And then you will see reports of, you know, a disproportionate response by Israel. Um, and for some reason, the mainstream media is completely, um, you know, uh, set on covering this story in a certain way with a certain narrative. You don't see the Palestinian terrorists that went into a bar in Tel Aviv on Thursday night and killed three young men, young, young men. One had recently just got engaged and was going to celebrate his engagement with his best friend. All of them young with uh, one of them having three young kids, the other two being under 30 years old. And this past, I guess, 10 days, we've had more than 14 or 15 casualties just like this. Normal people going to the supermarket, going to a bar, walking the streets, uh, and nothing's done, nothing is said, and the, the global media, again, is very silent about all of this. Um, but the IDF uh, has been able to neutralize some of these terrorists, and you'll see people like uh, Rashida Tlaib and uh, Ilhan Omar and, and AOC here lawmakers that were voted in uh, to, you know, defend, obviously, 
the United States and our ally Israel, but instead are, are defending these terrorists and talking about how Israel is neutralizing, but not talking about the woman who tried to stab a police officer right before she was neutralized. They only talk about the, the, the shooting of this woman. But anyway, um, this is what is going on. This is yet another flare up. We don't know if we're going to call this the third intifada, but it is yet another flare up in Israel. And uh, we pray for the people there that are just leading ordinary lives and uh, are now fearful to come out of their homes to do very ordinary things uh, for fear of being shot, being blown up, for fear of these terrorists who are hell bent on killing them. A big election is taking place in France with incumbent Emmanuel Macron facing stiff competition from far right nationalist Marine Le Pen in a winner takes all runoff for the French presidency, Lisa. Very interesting. Um, this always is, it fascinates me, the way that we're seeing Europe move more to the right. The only reason I say that is because if this were 10 years ago, you wouldn't even see a far right candidate even have a chance or even make it this far uh, in the primaries um, to, to be uh, on the ballot for for. for uh, the election. Um, we know, obviously, uh, Macron has, wants this very badly. He has taken some very bold actions in terms of their foreign policy. He went to meet with Putin. He tried to be the mediator there. Uh, didn't work too well, but obviously his name is out there. And obviously the French people see what he is doing and seeing that he is um, you know, really making an effort for peace between Ukraine and uh, Russia. Um, but again, the fact that there is a far right candidate tells me that Europeans see the damage of these lax policies by the left and is moving to the right and giving more politicians on the right a chance uh, to bring in that nationalism, to close their borders, to not be so lax on immigration and other policies. So it's definitely a wake-up call for France and, and all, many other European nations. Foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us from Los Angeles. My pleasure. Well, the Crow's Nest Pass is a vacation and tourist destination for many Southern Albertans, but the area is not just all camping, fishing, and skiing. It's been an economic driver of Alberta with mining, processing, and tourism. But what does the future look like for this valuable region of our province? Well, to discuss this and much more is Mayor Blair Painter, who joins me now from Crow's Nest Pass. Uh, welcome, Mayor Painter. So great to have you on today. Thank you very much, Dad. Okay, so one of the things that we see in many regions of Alberta is communities advocating for their workforce and promoting their local advantages. So what community revitalization programs are going on right now in your area? Well, as I'm sure you know, we do not have a major industry in our community. Um, so it's difficult to promote a workforce advantage but we do have a great natural advantage. As you know, our community has been, prepared, been preparing for local mining opportunities in the Crow's Nest Pass. And then after many studies, it's been determined that we have a housing shortage to be able to accommodate these types of things. With that in mind, we've been working on expanding and developing new homes and to fill these shortfalls. These mining ventures would employ 800 plus people Studies have shown that we would need accommodations for at least 200 or more families that would choose to live here. These additional families would strengthen our schools, hospitals, local businesses if they are allowed to proceed. The Crozness Pass is definitely open for business. As far as revitalization programs go, we've done numerous revitalization programs throughout the years in the downtown, starting with the downtown Coleman revitalization program being the latest. We'll be moving forward with a similar program in downtown Bellevue area in the next while, and we're excited for that to happen. Okay, so Mayor Painter, you were mentioning Crow's Nest Pass is open for business. It's so good to know, and you were saying that you would need to have more housing if mining were to go through. So how do you see that happening? Is that another industry that could possibly be something for Crow's Nest Pass? Well, pre presently we we have uh, we've we've gone down that path, and um, we are definitely looking for more housing in our community, more on the on the uh, aff attainable, affordable housing side for new families to start off with, um, and uh, that is progressing right now. Uh, what we do need is uh, more long term rentals 
which is something that our community struggles with as in other small communities. So um, it, it, it's definitely challenging, but we, we, but we're trying to address that part. So we're looking forward to that moving forward. Mm -hmm. sure. Are you looking to actually build more homes in that area? Correct. Correct. Yes. We're doing infills and new subdivisions and, uh, it, it's, uh, it's nice to see. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, before we were talking about how Crow's Nest Pass is actually, um, it accumulates, I guess it's five different communities. So what are those different communities and what's the population right now of the pass? Mm, the exact population, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we're, we're right in around that 5,700 uh, residents. Uh, plus we have a shadow population, which we calculate to be roughly around 2,500. So that you know, it brings us up in that area between seventy-five and uh, eight thousand uh, residents of our community. Wow! And then Blairmore and Col Coleman being the two kind of larger hubs there. Uh, we're, we're all you can you can divide the, the five of us by seventy-five hundred. You know, uh, twenty-five hundred to thirty-five hundred, uh, depending on which community you're looking at. So now, uh, Mayor Painter. Coal mining, of course, is such a hot topic here in Alberta. We hear so much conversation about the proposed mining on the eastern slopes of Alberta. And of course, this actually isn't limited just to the Crow's Nest Pass region, but it rather spans from the south to the north of our province. And of course, as you know, coal has been mined in Alberta for generations. But do you think that coal can continue to be mined safely in southern Alberta? Also, I'm curious too, what stance does most of your community take? Are they on the side of the miners or the anti-coal miners who wish to protect the land? Um, but what I can tell you is that, uh, you know, coal mining in Canada period uh, is an ethical way to extract our, our natural resources. Uh, the coal that is available in our region is premium metallurgical coal. It's used for steel making. There are only five or six places in the world where this quality of coal exists. So we would be naive to say that uh, our world, our global industry will not have a demand for steel. Um, so it's a matter of choice. Where do you wanna get the, uh, the coal to make this product? Do you want to get it out of a country that has no ethics when it comes to natural resources and our environment? Or should we use our resources here in Canada where it can be mined ethically? We can look after the environment and, uh, and provide a, a commodity that is world, needed on, on a worldwide level. So yes, I think Alberta can definitely be in this industry. We have a few existing coal mines in our region, in the south here. Um, that have been walked away from for whatever reason throughout the years, left in undesirable environmental conditions. Um, moving ahead with these to, to bring them back into production would, would accommodate or would accomplish a couple different things. First of all, it would, um, it would create long-term employment, well-paying jobs for the next 25, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and also it would address an issue that we are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, which is a pourable environmental conditions left that left at those sites. So when these mines are, if they were able to, to start producing again, they would be forced to, to clean this up when they're done their project. Those governmental regulations and rules weren't in place years ago, they are in place today. So you can't do an industry like this today that you could have done, I'm gonna say even 20 years ago, things have changed. So the stringent regulations and um, you know, guidelines for, for our environment are in place right now. And I think it, it can go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe can you give us an idea of the type of economic impact that your region, could, that something like that could have on your region? You know, if a new mine on an existing um, previously disturbed area was to take place, um, you're looking at roughly eight, 800 employees to get that mine started over a two to three year period. 
And then once, once it's developed, then it, it's going to take about 350 to 400 employees to keep that project moving forward. So for our community, you know, we're looking at the initial uh, influx of around 800 people into our community. Um, that's good for our businesses, for our hospitals, for our schools, et cetera, et cetera, on a shorter term basis. Um, and then when it actually um, gets into production, you know, that we know we won't see 400 people living in the municipality across this path. People travel these days to go to work. But it wouldn't be unrealistic that we get a quarter or a third of these people living in our community, which again, that strengthens uh, our schools, our hospitals, our, our business core. Uh, we're going to see entrepreneurs come out of these people and, and create more businesses. So it's just a win-win uh, economically for a community. And uh, we have the resources here. Why don't we develop them? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really great picture of uh, the economic impact. Do you think that there could be new technologies being developed that could make coal mining safer for the environment? Well, absolutely. Why not, right? Uh, we see uh, tech resources on the BC side that have inherited a, a, a water problem. And uh, right now, tech is global leaders in the clean, clean water industry. Uh, they've spent billions of dollars um, to develop a clean water strategy and to, to be able to put contaminated water, clean it, and put it back into the river. So, yeah, there's definitely going to be uh, things that pop up from time to time. And, uh, you know, why wouldn't there be an opportunity to, uh, to grow that? No, that's awesome. Uh, now, the natural areas for skiing and fishing, of course, are so important to the citizens of your area. Can you maybe talk about uh, the people's connection to the land? Well, you know, those that are fortunate enough to live in our community can appreciate that, uh, you know, within a five, 10 minute walk, uh, they're into the wilderness. Um, and uh, that's really important for the people who live here. And that's why they choose, they choose to, live, to live here. Um, we have an abundance of, of uh, natural recreation um, that, we can, that we can visit on a daily basis, whether it's hiking or fishing or, you know, we have great cross-country skiing. We have a downhill ski hill right in town. We have a swimming pool. We have an amazing golf course. Like, it can go on and on and on. Um, and that's all within a five, 10-minute drive or, you know, Literally, wherever you live in our community, a 10-minute walk and you're into the wilderness. So that's, mm -hmm. that's part of it. Now, you mentioned the ski hill. So, of course, that's a huge attraction that's been operating for, what, almost 100 years in the past. So we're talking the the past the powder keg ski area. Uh, some of us, we sometimes tend to forget about it, but it's right there. So what can you tell us about how this ski hill has been developed in the last several years? Well, the past part of Cake Ski Hill, or PPK as we like to call it, is uh, definitely a great asset to our community. And uh, we are seeing growing numbers um, of people from all around Southern Alberta coming to our ski hill. And every year it grows and grows and grows. So, um, you know, this, this ski hill is, uh, uh, I'm not gonna date myself, but apparently in earlier years, there was even a rope toes on this ski hill. And then it progressed to, to T-Bar. And uh, although we'd like to say, hey, let's put a chairlift in there, uh, we just don't have the volumes of people so far to be able to make that work. But what we, what we did do is we, uh, we did extend the length of our lower lift a couple of years ago, just to make this, the uh, ski experience uh, more enjoyable for everybody. And uh, one of the other things that we've done recently is um, uh, change all of our uh, sodium lighting to LED, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, <laughs> to, to gain some uh, financial benefits, <laughs> a little bit cheaper to run these things than it is for uh, high pressure sodium. So uh, that's nice. And, uh, you know, I would encourage uh, those that haven't experienced night vision or night skiing to come out and, uh, and try it out because it is totally different uh, skiing experience. 
Okay, so jumping from uh, nature and skiing, let's let's talk about something else here. So the community of Coleman had an initiative to become a regional arts hub. So what changes have you seen over the last few years with that? You know, we, we did a revitalization program uh, a couple or three years ago, I think it is now, uh, in that area. And, um, you know, that was spurred by uh, infrastructure concerns and, uh, and, and a will uh, of, of our council and, and, and those that uh, frequent the downtown Coleman to, to do this revitalization project there. And um, what, what we've been able to do is to um, promote the arts in our community and also our history of the area. So not only do we have different artist studios down there, we also have uh, restaurants that, uh, that cater to, to everybody. And we have the uh, Alberta Police Barracks um, facility, which is right beside our museum. On, when was it? I think it was two, two years ago, we also installed um, EV charging station in that, in that area to accommodate uh, electric vehicles that are touring through our community. So it, it, you know, it's, it's a nice place to stop, um, charge your car, Check out the museum, APB building, have some lunch, whatever, and uh, and then move on. So yeah, we're excited about that, and I, and I think it's uh, the people that are they that frequent that area are really uh, pleased with what we've done as well. We also have a Roxy Theater there, an old theater that um, has just recently been um, designated as a, a historic site, a historic building. And uh, we have a group that's moving uh, to uh, renovate and rejuvenate that building uh, into something along the lines of live theater. So we're looking forward to that uh, coming to fruition in the next uh, short while. Mayor Blair Painter, thanks so much for joining me today. It looks like we are out of time, but it was great having you on. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. That was the mayor of Crow's Nest Pass, such a beautiful corner of our province, and we hope that you and your family will be able to enjoy the natural wonders of southwestern Alberta this summer. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for joining us.